Hello everybody, welcome to Fruitful Trees and I have another special treat for you today. I'm always going to different nurseries and I'm going to different friends' houses who are growing trees and growing other edible greens and today I'm at an amazing place. This is Connor's place. It's called Incredible Edible Greens and trees and growing everything there. They're a nursery in Loxahatchee, Florida. I'm going to put the name and the link and, and all the links below so you can go check that out. If you are looking for trees, this is one of the nurseries out there that have trees that no one else has. When I'm looking to find things, this is a place I definitely go and I call up Connor because I know he has these things. And what's really cool on his website, he even have a list of everything he has in stock so you can see what I'm talking about. But not just trees. I mean, I'm into eating the food for my nutrition. And he has things besides just food. So if I want to have a garden, uh, or if you want to put a garden in, he's the type of guy that will come out of your house and show you how to do it. He'll actually do it for you. That's what he does. It's not just about selling trees with him. He literally goes and he installs gardens, edible green gardens. Uh, and he deals a lot with perennial greens. This is the guy you want to know if you're into health. Or if you're into just growing foods, Connor's the guy you want to know. Incredible, edible, and that's what it is. Incredibly edible. And we're going to check it out now. This is Connor, and this is his nursery in Lock Tehachi, Florida. Here it goes. Okay, everybody, here we are at Incredible Edible Landscapes, and this is Connor. And Connor had a smaller place here in West Palm, and now he's got this big nursery. So, how are you doing, Connor? Pretty good. Excited to uh, be doing a video with you, Paul. Yes, uh, tell us about this place and your dream and what's happening here. Right, so I'll just read off the banner. We're here at Incredible Edible Landscapes. We like to call ourselves South Florida's number one food forest supply source. So we're growing fruit trees, tropical veggies, and lots of support plants. And uh, we try to make it so that when people want to set up a garden, they start with the easy to grow stuff. And uh, you know, we have just like this amazing climate here to grow our own food, but a lot of people don't know what to actually start with, what crops to plant, and how to do it. And that's kind of our market is those first time gardeners or maybe even seasoned gardeners that uh, just need a little bit of help uh, getting their food forest going and want to learn about how to use different plants to put more life into their planting, whether it's food forest, veggie garden, some agroforestry style planting. Uh, we're kind of a, a hub for all that different stuff. We got a lot of different support species and things that work well for us. We have kind of a unique planting style that I've, I've picked little bits from all different growers that I look up to and kind of assimilated our own way of planting things. And uh, I try to just help people garden in a way that makes it fun and they get results. Very cool. And they see the sign here, the three things, fruit trees, tropical veggies, and easy to grow. So easy those are grow. the three main focuses of yours, right? Yeah. That's what we like to start with. And once you get a little bit of success under your belt, then people can branch off into the uh, maybe more tough to grow stuff, the rarer stuff, the more novelty items. But I'll, I'll get into it as we walk through, but there are definitely some main staple fruit trees that we recommend to people starting out. Now, do some of the perennial greens that you have here uh, fruit all year, or they all have a season? Uh, there are seasons where maybe one species is at its peak in terms of growth, whether that's winter or summer. Uh, we have different tropical veggies that can be grown year round. So there's, there's a season for everything, but they are all mainly perennials that can be planted once and grown continuously. Now as for fruit trees, my personal focus is not the collective special editions, it's actual food. Production. And yeah. production, but also meals, not snacks. Yes. So once you show us your trees, show us some good ones that people can actually sit down and, and get full from it and not just... Yeah. Only pick up fruit here and there because this is edible, you know, for food. This is this is what it's about between the greens. Like in this spot here, if you and your family wanted to live here, everything you need can be grown here. Is that correct or no? For the most part, we're, we focus on high value crops 
as our main kind of pillars in our planting area. And, um, but that could also mean high market value because uh, like, you know, a mango has a, a high market value versus um, some other crops that maybe don't. And so you have to consider what is inherently valuable and also fills your plate and is easy to grow. And, and you know, depending on if you live in a HOA or something like that, what looks good as well. And if all of those things come together, that's how we kind of pick and recommend what you should grow. And considering how well mangoes grow down here, why do you think there's such a high market for it? That is a good question. Just because of <laughs> the demand and uh, the quality of, of some of these varieties. I mean, some of them, they grow so well, but it doesn't mean that there's not a lot of work put into it. It, it still is a lot of work to grow premium mangoes. Uh, I mean, even if you grow commercial varieties, it still is work. There still is a lot of labor to it. And, um, you know, it, we're, we're really talking about more on a home scale here. And that means higher quality produce and more ideal, closer toward natural or organic growing conditions. And so that creates a higher value. Uh, fruit or product for a lot of people and if somebody wanted to not only do you install gardens But you'll pick out the perfect tree for them and their situation And you'll put you install for them as well. That's part of your service, right? Uh, yeah, we do installs uh, Kind of constantly reevaluating the way we do installs um, We're definitely focusing more and more lately on our nursery production and making this property into uh, more of a destination where we can kind of meet everybody's needs here and um, you know whether you've got a, a small budget or a large budget whether you've got a lot of space or a small space uh, we're trying to provide that value for people here and uh, we do offer installation services as well and uh, some consulting here and there but uh, at the current moment there's still so much potential that we are yet to uh, bring about at this property that we're really focusing a lot of our efforts on building this place up to what I see in my vision of what it can be. All right, show us around Let's what you've done already because when I first came here, it was a, a old, what was it, like an old nursery, like not taken care of pretty much? Well, you kept asking me to come and do a video and for a couple of years, I kept saying, no, Paul, we gotta wait, we gotta wait, we gotta wait. Because this, nothing that you see here now is how it was when we purchased a little over two years ago. Uh, this was an old palm tree nursery. It was very, very neglected. Um, it just, it, we weren't even able to plant any areas right away because it, it needed a lot of work. And so we had to clean everything up. There was tons of trash here, tons of, huge useless palm trees that we took out in order to plant our groves. Uh, the, the nursery needed a lot of infrastructure work so we were really in that reconstruction phase for quite a while at least a year or so and uh, now we're kind of at the point where I'm like hey Paul let's do a video now because I have something I can I can show and uh, we've got a system and a you know our retail setup is pretty much established now so uh, well it's a perfect example because of the way it wasn't what you've done you could do this to people's houses no matter how bad the quality is or how yeah. dirty it is you can clean it up and make it edible yeah that's what you do All yeah right, yeah as long as you're willing to make yeah. changes certainly like this area I was just uh, I was just explaining this this whole area right here was a complete desert a, impossible to grow anything it was a foot deep of compacted road base right here so this was a big investment in getting this into a state where we could plant these things. And we're still working out the kinks. Uh, had to import a lot of soil and scrape out that road base. So this was not, this did not start from your typical sandy Florida yard, which is pretty easy to work with. This was a big challenge. Some of our other areas, not so much. We just had to clear some things out of the way. Um, but this is our, obviously our first main demonstration garden when you come in the gate 
and my wife's got these pretty zinnias growing up here. Are those edible? Uh, these are not, but they are bringing in lots of beneficial pollinators and just adding that little element of beauty here and uh, covering the ground. And then we've got a couple different rows of trees here. Actually, along the front fence, we've got uh, Grumichama, Pitomba, Grumichama, Pitomba. And then there's a yerba mate right there. That's a source of caffeine. We can walk through the middle if you want. So we've already harvested from a couple of these trees. We got some pitombas off of this little one already. And it's actually flowering again right now, which is great. It's a little flower down there. And uh, a lot of mulch here, huh? Lots of mulch. That's kind of our key to improving the soil and helping these young fruit trees start off to uh, a good life and get established. So we got loquats. I have sweet potatoes along the ground here that are growing. We've got pineapples we just planted here. There's elderberry there. So that's for your, uh, you know, good healthy uh, immune boosting elderberry syrup. I've got African basil right here. That's bringing in the pollinators and we can eat that if we want. Uh, you'll see a lot of these around the property. This is an edible species of canna lily. It makes a big starchy potato-like tuber. So we can eat that if we want. I've got yucca back here, another starch crop, calorie crop. You'll see bananas all over the place. This is a special variety called Missy Lucky. Uh, I've got a mame right here. That's that dwarf variety, that pumpkin pie. And uh, lots of different support species in here, like right here. I've got some candlestick cassia. This is a, a nitrogen fixer and kind of a pioneer plant that improves the soil as it grows. It's a good chop and drop plant and a good pollinator attractor too. So bringing in those beneficial insects to help keep your pests under control. Here's a sweet tart mango. And uh, a lot of our trees are less than a year in the ground. So we're not getting production quite yet. Some of them are producing, but uh, What's your favorite mango? What's my favorite mango? You can't ask me that. I got too <laughs> many. I have 12 trees in the ground right now, 12 mangoes. Um, and I guess that question is, I would, I would ask like for what application, right? Because it depends if you have a lot of space. Are you east of 95? Are you west of 95? Sure. Um, so my, my acreage customers that are out here out west, I'll recommend different mangoes to them than I would to, uh, to you or to somebody that's east of the turnpike where you've got a little less disease pressure. So out here I might recommend Pickering, I might recommend uh, Little Gem, I might recommend Dwarf Hawaiian and uh, some of these other varieties. So depends where you're at, depends how much space you have. Sure. Here's a Fairchild Canistel. That one's still uh, yet to give me a lot of growth after being planted. So we'll keep on nurturing that one. And we're walking, walking past a few different avocados. Here's a day avocado. And this is, I shouldn't really be allowing it to fruit now since it's just its first year in the ground, but this one does have a few fruits on it. That one fruited last year in the pot too. And here's a dwarf Namwa banana. A day, or a, that's an Oro Negro avocado. There's now, how far apart are your avocados? These ones are pretty close. They are, I believe it was about 13 foot on center. So that's kind of pushing it. Uh, really, ideally you would go 15 foot plus. Um, but we plan on rigorously pruning them and uh, keeping it, keeping everything kind of manicured to, to a degree up here. Um, just because this is our display garden, but I wanted to get a few good varieties in up here. So we did push right. the boundaries on that spacing. And you'll see lots of other edibles just kind of surrounding here. There's another pigeon pea. I've got some galangal on that side of the row. There's a creme brulee mango. Let's see. Here's one of my butterscotch sapodillas. How many do you have in the ground? Two in the ground. That's a really special sapodilla, and we're kind of 
I'm kind of focusing my grafting efforts exclusively on that variety because it is hard to get a hold of. Uh, but I've been getting the hang of grafting them. Nice. So other than this, this beautiful display garden area, you have some other personal areas as well. But here's your tree selection that you're selling all these different trees. Yeah. Look at this mango with all these mangoes on here. Yeah. Uh, this is what a what this size? This is a kaiser. Uh, what size? Uh, uh, so these are our, our biggest size that we normally grow, which is 25 gallon mangoes. Uh, Sometimes we occasionally step them up a little bigger if they're worthy of it. But um, these That's are kind nice. of the main ones that are facing the road. And uh, Kesar mango in the pot. <laughs> yeah, this and, one's got a lot of fruit yeah, on it. And that's a, one of the best mangoes, one of my favorites. Actually. And I probably should have thinned out those fruit a little bit. But it's, uh, it's too late in the game now to, you know, might yeah. as well just see how they do. Yep. All right, so you got these 25-gallon... Uh, yep, pots. and some of the 15 gallons are fruiting as well. What At what point do you not let them fruit so they can grow better? Like seven gallon? Anything seven gallon and below, we pick all the fruit off. Got if it. it's a 15 gallon and I don't feel like it's got enough roots and structure yet, if the trunk's not thick enough, where I'm making a judgment of, I don't think this should hold fruit yet, then we pick it off. Because um, really, you need to grow a tree before you grow fruit. So I'm, I'm always breaking our clients' hearts when they, they pick this mango they're really attracted to because it's got a fruit on it, and then they buy it or we'll go and plant it for them. And I, especially when we're planting it, I'll say, look, I gotta break your heart here. I gotta pick all these fruits off because especially when you're just putting it in the ground, that tree needs to grow roots. It and if it's, yeah. if it's burdened with ripening up all of this sugar, and it's trying to grow roots at the same time, you can have some dieback, you can have really a, a struggle with that tree. So it's better in the long run to wait for them to fruit. Sure, there's a uh, ice cream in a pot. That's nice. Yes, this one, uh, my two-year-old ripped the fruit off of yesterday and it didn't seem ready to me, but hopefully it does ripen yeah. up properly. There was That's a fruit great, hanging on that great one. Great mango, okay. <laughs> yeah, show us what else you got. So we put in this bamboo line to hopefully dampen some of the sound from the highway. We're right on Seminole Pratt Whitney and we get 30,000 cars a day and lots of dump trucks and loud noise driving by all the time. So we put in the bamboo as a little wind buffer and a little bit of a privacy screen. And there is uh, an edible variety in here. About every fifth clump is uh, old hamii which makes edible shoots. So uh, that one's a 60 footer, beautiful, beautiful clumping bamboo. Now I see you have the irrigation here. Is this on a well? Uh, no, we don't use well water. There was a well here when I bought the property, but the salinity was extremely high. It was a 20 year old well, it was super deep and it just, the water had really turned salty. There's a lot of development in this area the past few years so all of that all those new wells being drilled and all that water getting drawn up out of the ground has really concentrated the dissolved solids in certain areas so when we first moved here we tried to irrigate with the well and it started burning everything with the salt so uh, I just actually completely buried the well just decomm decommissioned it and we are fortunate to be on county water here so we're using county water for our irrigation. And um, obviously our water bill goes up, but that's just part of the cost of doing business. So it's, uh, it's no big deal. Sure. So yeah, all the bigger pots are on these spot spitters for irrigation. And then as you get to the seven gallons, these are on uh, two gallon an hour drippers. So every plant is individually watered. Uh, the drip goes on for five minutes every morning. And then our, our smaller pots, our three gallons and one gallon material is on overhead irrigation. It's all packed together and there's uh, overhead wobblers that are irrigating those. They look great, they look great, all right. Yes, we try to, uh, try to make sure our plants are happy here. So there's a lot of mango varieties. I am currently up to about 60 varieties in stock. So there's definitely uh, a mango for everybody here or multiple. 
You have a lot of Indian varieties? Uh, yeah, and some of the lines are getting blurred between the Indian varieties and the Florida varieties as they're getting hybridized with each other. Like I'm looking at a Super Alfonso right here. So, you know, Alfonso is very, very popular fruit across the world and grown a lot, primarily in India. And uh, through the Zill breeding program, we now have Super Alfonso, which has Alfonso genetics, but is a much better performer, producer for Florida. And it makes a, a very delicious fruit that tastes as good as Alfonso does. All right. Well, so. this is an amazing uh, display of, I see avocado trees, I see mangoes here, and I've looked around and I saw a bunch of uh, adenoyas and, uh, adenoyas and uh, a whole bunch of uh, custard apples he has, and I saw Rolinia. Yeah, we try to meet the demand for the, uh, there's a lot of demand for certain trees. Obviously, mangoes are probably what we have the most of. Uh, there's a lot of demand for anonas. After Atamoyas, uh, we're grafting Cherilada, um, Soursop, Custard Apple, uh, got some really pretty Rolidias right here. Check that Beautiful. out. Beautiful. Got to be some of the, the coolest leaves you've ever I seen. I actually got my Rolidia tree from you, I believe. Did you? Yeah, a long time ago. Awesome. How's it doing? Uh, doing great. Doing yeah. great. No fruit yet, but doing great. Cool. All right, and then uh, so here's their amazing fruit tree selection, looking great. Yeah, so we got everything from three gallon up to 25 gallon and beyond. I'll just quickly show you the three gallon section, then we can check out the other side with the veggies. A lot of Jabota Cabas in that row. How long before a three gallon mango will turn into a seven gallon mango? Um, sometimes it depends on the variety. Some of them will grow faster and uh, they'll grow roots faster. Uh, it can also depend on how old the rootstock was. But generally, once we start seeing that they're fully rooted and the, the graft is turning nice and woody and lignified and the, the caliper of the trunk is thicker, uh, then we'll step them up. We try to stay on top of it so that nothing gets root bound and because uh, if, if you wait too long and you step up something that's root bound and it's overdue then it can have this kind of stunted period where it won't grow for a while and uh, and you'd have to cut the roots off you have to trim the roots so that it doesn't stay root bound and then it's got to regrow those roots and it might have this phase where it's got to kind of it, it's not, not going to look very good for a while and then it'll finally grow so we try to pot them up when they're like at that ideal stage. The roots are starting to really spread out and fill that pot, but they're not root bound yet. And uh, that way they can keep going at that really healthy growth rate as they get stepped up. Now, do you do your grafting yourself here on the trees or do you get these from nurseries? So like the mangoes, 99.9% .9 of these are from Zills and they're the biggest producer of mangoes this side of the world basically. Uh, I do graft some of my own but not nearly enough to meet the demand. Uh, however there are some other fruit trees here that um, are basically exclusively produced here. Uh, like we grow all of our own mulberries. Um, this year we're growing all of our own loquats. All of the new loquats over there are were grafted here. Um, we're going to be doing more of our own star fruits. Uh, I'm grafting mulberries, bananas. Uh, as, as our banana collection starts to mature here, we're going to be producing all of our own bananas. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that kind of sets us apart from a lot of other nurseries is, is we're, we're farming these plants and producing them. And we're buying in what we need to meet demand, but um, we're a little bit more uh, engaged with the production process of these plants instead of just buying and reselling. Sure. And besides the trees here, you have a whole other area here of just more edible greens. Yeah, let's edible take a look. Greens, uh, for people's gardens. Yeah, and so this side of the nursery is the vast majority of this material here is propagated here on site. These are all the perennial vegetables and herbs and spices and 
supportive species that I've collected over the past five years and have uh, grown them out, planted them out, learned where they like to be planted, how they like to grow, how you can use them in companion with other trees and how to propagate them I've learned over the years um, so that we can grow all of our own stock here. So we've got this uh, wonderful salad tree that uh, John Kohler is a big fan of. So when you say a salad tree, what's, what is it actually? So this is actually in the hibiscus family and it makes a very tender leaf. And can I, can I it is, go ahead, yeah. It is as close as you can get to a romaine lettuce that you can grow year round here in South Florida. Um, so a lot of, this is like a great example of a lot of the vegetable crops that people are kind of used to buying in the store are not actually grown here. And if they are, they're not grown all year here. They're grown in a short window when the weather cools off in the wintertime. Um, Plants like this are the tropical alternative that's much easier to grow and in most cases they're perennial. So you plant this once and it, you can harvest it and harvest and harvest and it will continue to grow for multiple years instead of just, you know, you could plant a head lettuce and it grows very fast. You get that one harvest and it's done and if you plant it the wrong time of year it might bolt and not even be any good. So these are the tougher plants, um, just much more hardy to our, I mean, it's, it's super hot and humid right now. And uh, a lot of the, like if you were growing tomatoes and whatnot this time of year, they would really be a struggle. It's hard to grow everything now, but you're saying these plants, these are in pots, but if these were in the ground, these salad trees, they would do fine. Oh yeah. I can show you uh, several examples that we have planted around here. Okay, yeah, we'd love to see that, okay. Here's another one, it's kind of a, a new item for us. This is called mushroom herb. And uh, it's a crunchy, it's a crunchy green and it tastes like mushrooms. Go ahead and try it. It's, a, it's actually, it's really good. Good texture to it. And it's really got that mushroom flavor to it. Interesting. And actually if you cook this one, like most greens, if you cook them, the flavor is kind of disappears. The cooking actually increases the mushroom flavor with these. So, and uh, I've, I've grown this plant now for long enough to know that it likes a little bit of partial shade and it likes decently moist soil. So this would be a good one to plant um, like underneath the leaves of a banana, for example. So it would kind of enjoy that, that little microclimate there. And that's a way you can grow two crops in one space. And then, you know, we can expound on that and see what else can grow. And you could use these as well, right? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you could. This one's got a little volunteer Egyptian spinach growing in it. And those are right here. So that probably... Egyptian spinach is another uh, crop that'll grow well in the heat here. Yeah, absolutely. Which uh, is good. And these ones, I just trimmed them up yesterday. So I'm trying to find these little... They make these little pods here that when you get them when they're tender... They taste just like a cucumber, and uh, they're very refreshing. But the the leafy, the leafy greens on these are excellent as well. Uh, it's a good cooking green. You can eat it raw, but it's kind of a. I find it to be the best when you saute it or like add it into a soup or a sauce or something like that. Sure, and then I see some katuk back there. Yeah, this is one of my favorites, and these are looking beautiful right now. This is a very high protein leafy green. This one can be eaten raw as well, but uh, is, uh, in my opinion, better to consume cooked, uh, especially in, in quantity. I mean, you can throw a handful of katuk leaves into a meal and, and it's good that way, like raw, but it makes an excellent cooked green and it actually, the texture of, and of these leaves, um, Normal spinach, you throw it on a pan, you throw a pound of spinach on there, it turns into nothing. Well, katuk actually holds its structure from cooking and it doesn't shrink down into a tiny, tiny little side dish. Um, so that's, that's one of the cool things about katuk and it's got uh, about 48% protein by weight. Wow. It's got a good little kind of uh, broccoli flavor to it. Wow, just amazing. 
endless amounts of edible vegetables. Uh, yep. You can create an edible garden and all year in South Florida, which is a really special thing. Yeah, I can just run through, like, just point out a couple more real quick, then we sure. can move on to a different area. Sure. Um, there's goji berries. This is Okinawa spinach, which is looking pretty right now. There's some overflow of bananas on this side. There's Thai basil right here. Now, how and much of your daily diet is these foods? Um, a percentage of my diet, uh, probably hard to say, but we do eat these plants with our daily meals in some way, shape, or, or another. Um, you know, whenever we're, whenever my wife is uh, making a meal, she's always thinking like, what can I add to this from the garden? So some little bits and pieces at, at the very least get added into pretty much anything that she's cooking. And then sometimes we have, uh, you know, we're harvesting uh, more substantial amounts of one thing or another, whether it's yucca or bananas or something, and that that would end up as a more of a bigger part of a meal too. Uh, so we're really just getting going on production for ourselves because the the first couple of years here, I was really focused on just getting the the nursery stock going. I actually, um, I when we first came here. You know, obviously I didn't have a repository of any of these plants in the ground. I was starting from nothing. So we were propagating exclusively from our existing nursery stock. So I had to make sure that we weren't running out of things because otherwise, like if I sold all my Thai basil, I'd have nothing to propagate from. Now we have it in the ground and they're growing and established. So I can uh, be, I can kind of switch my priorities there. And if someone buys all of the basil, for example, I can, I can make more from what we have that's growing. Very cool. So, uh, we got dwarf, dwarf namwa bananas yep, here. Yep, lots of these. Um, chaya. Of these here too. This is they like got chaya. They got chaya the here. most bulletproof edible green that you can grow. Super tough, hardy plant. There's papayas over here. And then uh, there's roselle up there. This is lipia alba, which makes a really Amazing tea. Give that a smell. It's like a, it's like a sweet lemony oh, wow. smell. So that makes a very uh, like uplifting and energizing type of tea. And then this would be the beginning of more of our native section. So we've got like the native blanket flower for the pollinators and some other cool, interesting native plants in here and things that'll attract pollinators. We got the blue butterfly pea. That one's a really fun plant for people to grow. There's Sunshine Mimosa, one of the prettiest little ground covers. That's a Florida native, and it's uh, it's way more drought tolerant than grass, way less maintenance. So a lot of people like to remove portions of their lawn and plant this instead. Let that become the grass alternative, and you can walk on it. And then every morning you get those little pretty pink puff balls, and uh, just takes way less maintenance and input. Uh, I don't, there's no edible parts on that. The perennial peanut is another one we use for that, and that does have an edible flower. That's yellow, the flower, right? Yeah, they're, uh, they're not blooming right now, but yep. So most of this is not uh, grown for food for us, but more grown for food for the native wildlife. And uh, if you kind of feed the birds and feed the beneficial insects, then they will in turn help to reduce the, the pest problems for the crops you're growing for yourself. So like if I'm bringing in, um, if I'm growing a lot of flowering plants and I'm bringing in predatory wasps, the predatory wasps will also go after the caterpillars that maybe are they're eating my trees. So that uh, takes a little bit of that work and responsibility off my shoulders and it also just adds some beauty and these are things you can stick in in between the spaces of your production plants. Some of them do have good edible aspects too though, like the beauty berry here. They're flowering now. Oh, just broke that branch. Beauty berry uh, makes a tasty little purple berry and we've made jelly with it before and it actually was surprisingly good. So uh, there are little bits and pieces from the native selection that you can eat as well. Even this, Yapon Holly, 
This is a native and very common in landscaping, a little low level shrub. That actually is, uh, has the highest caffeine content of any native North American plant. It's about wow. two thirds the caffeine of coffee. So you could grow that, make yapon tea, and you could replace your coffee with that. Wow. So I'm gonna put uh, Connor's contact information, his website below in the description. If anyone wants to come check this place out to get ideas for your own garden or you want to pick up some some perennial plants and tropical vegetables and trees, definitely contact them. When John was here about a week and a half ago, he was really excited about the, the variegated Nopales. So he said he, he had never come across it before. He had the green one, but not this it one. It is beautiful. And this is edible. These are edible. Yeah. It's, a, it's a staple vegetable in, uh, in Mexico. So they add this to pretty much every every meal, and it's a great digestive regulator. It just uh, helps to make your digestive process more efficient. So great plant, and you would cook it up kind of like how you'd prepare uh, a bell pepper. If you were gonna, you would kind of like cut it into slices and throw it on a pan, and like saute it. You can eat them raw too. You'd probably want to pick the real young growth raw but it is a spineless cactus so that's just uh, another crop for you know say say the world the world totally ends and uh, you need plants that are just survivors that's one of them there you go all right and how does they grow well out here mm-hmm okay take a look at this this is another one of our gardens that we use a lot as um, a way to kind of demonstrate the concept of planting in this agroforestry style so our our main crop in here and you can't even see most of them now because a lot of our support plants have grown up around them but our main crop is mangoes so there's a pickering mango right there and then we have a tree every 16 foot. So 16 foot over this way, we have a honey kiss. And then there's a super Alfonso and an orange sherbet at the end. And then in between those, right in the center, we have bananas. And the idea is for the next few years, it's gonna take some time for those mangoes to grow to their larger mature size. In the meantime, I can't plant my mangoes eight foot apart, but I can put a banana at eight feet in between them. And for several years, I can get bananas. Like this is Raja Puri that's fruiting right now. Nice. And I can get several crop cycles out of that. And then as my mangoes get bigger and start to grow toward each other, I can phase out the bananas. I can remove these, I can plant them somewhere else. But uh, I'm not just sitting here waiting for my main tree to start producing. I'm, I'm generating a yield in the meantime. And you can kind of expound on that into these other layers. I've got turmeric planted right there. That's the blue turmeric, very medicinal um, anti-inflammatory root. I've got Cuban oregano and I've got Tulsi right there. I've got some collard greens. Here's some of that mushroom plant I was talking about. And that's, like I said, right under the little bit of shade from the banana. I've got taro root right in the middle there and loving the shade. There's pigeon pea here. And a lot of this, at this time of year, it's been a little bit since we did a, a prune on this row. So now that my pigeon pea is starting to really fill that space and starting to overlap that mango, and now that my vetiver is getting tall again, it's time to come through here um, with a pair of these and start to prune things off of each other. And when you do that, all of these plants have their roots kind of in close proximity to each other. When I do a big prune on these fast growing things like pigeon pea, it actually will cause the roots to, uh, to exude uh, nutrients and different uh, like growth hormones and whatnot into the soil my other plants like my mangoes will respond to that so you're actually 
you, the term that I heard and will use is called you're, you're pulsing it. So you're pulsing that system. I'm cutting off all my fast growing biomass and laying it on the ground as mulch, adding to that soil from the top down, but the roots are also doing some work there as well. They're kind of waking each other up because they're going to react to that prune. So really, uh, really fun way of ultimately just growing mangoes, but there's a lot more going on and there's a lot more to look at here. And here's another uh, one of those salad trees. This is oh, wow, a, a really beautiful tree. one that uh, I collected. So there's a, there's a now, red leaf version. How much work is to maintain all this? Because it can get out of control, no? Uh, I would say for this, for this particular example right here, if I had just the four mangoes and it was just grass in between them, in the about 12 months since these have been planted, I would have spent more time just mowing that grass than the total amount of time that I've spent just maintaining this as it is. But I also would have gotten much less yields because I'm already getting bananas, I'm already getting vegetables, I have peppers down at the end that have just been making like nonstop production of shishito peppers. So it, the, the difference between the amount of work, maybe it's marginal, but I'm getting so much more out of it that in terms of like minutes spent working uh, times what you get out of it, it's more rewarding. Okay, and that's what you teach people how to do, make this mm -hmm. rewarding and, and to get the food that they need out of it. Yeah. And look at that. So, so the other the trees, side... The trees grow just as well in, in, amongst everything growing around. Yeah, and, and like I said, right now, this is about as dense as we'll let it get. If I had... So the only mango that's producing is that pickering. If I had all of these with a crop on them right now, like this honey kiss is not fruiting right now. If I had fruit on it, then I would approach this differently and I would be pruning this more because I want more airflow in there to help uh, keep the fruit healthy. But at this point, I'm just encouraging growth. And this tree does not mind being kind of surrounded by everything else here because as long as I am pruning it regularly and letting that tree kind of dominate over time, uh, they're perfectly happy. So at this point when I'm just growing the tree and I'm not worried about fruit, yeah, it's, it's fine to let things even get a little bit overcrowded because you get in there and you clean it up and, and then it just, it really lights the whole thing up and you get a big response from mangoes and they'll, they'll grow a lot after you cut. So here's, right. a, here's a dwarf namwa that's showing you what the meaning of dwarf is, like almost, almost resting on the ground. Yep. And then we have some yucca, more sweet potatoes on the ground. Here's moringa, kind of planted in between here. And uh, this is meant to be something that uh, the moringa doesn't take up a lot of lateral space, but it does grow up high. And so we'll be cutting these down low periodically, letting them regrow. And we get to eat as much as we want of it. I can preserve that, but I can also use that as a source of mulch and like fertility for the soil. So you know how much nutrients and minerals these leaves have. I can eat as much of that as I want, but I can also add it back to the soil. And so this Moringa may have, be more talented, let's say, at pulling trace minerals and vitamins and stuff out of the ground than some of my other plants. So I can use that to my advantage. I can put that back on the ground and kind of feed it back. So Excellent. we'd call it a nutrient accumulator. Now here's a tree, a mature tree on a property. Is this a fruit tree or? This is an ice cream bean. This was uh, one of the off. very few fruit trees that were here when we purchased. And uh, we can actually see if I can find a good one right now and uh, we can crack it open and I'll show you. Let me grab this branch. I see a good one. Where'd it go? I see a good one right here. Drop two of them. So this is a kind of a novelty fruit. My one-year-old just discovered these and he loves them now. Wow. So it's like a 
like a bean pod and it's got these little seeds in here but around the seed is this fluffy white like a cotton candy texture go ahead and try that right around the seed and yeah you can just pop it in your mouth and kind of eat around the yeah. seed and uh, spit the seed out or you can peel it off excellent but uh, you know that's not gonna feed your family or really fill you up but this was already here. It makes a great shade tree. It's shading my taro, so I'm using that to my advantage. And taro is another calorie crop. Um, so it's just a, a fun kind of novelty tree. But you can also use this the ice cream bean as um, in an agroforestry setting. I could plant these along my other row behind you with the mangoes. And this is a nitrogen fixing tree. So it's going to add nitrogen to the soil and I can cut it repeatedly. It'll grow right back. Um, this tree is sometimes used in coffee plantations as a source of shade, and then they grow the coffee underneath that. So there's a lot of uses for some of these tropical plants besides just food production. You can actually use them to improve your food production process. So that's really cool. Very cool. Very beautiful the way he's puts this all together here. So, and you sell those ice cream beans if people want to buy them, the trees? Yeah, we have the trees. Yeah, we, we plant a lot of seeds from that tree. We grow those trees up. And, uh, you know, if somebody comes and visits and we happen to have some ready to pick ice cream bean fruit, then you get to try it too. All right. And, uh, so you have some more trees in the ground, or is that yeah. pretty much? Yeah, uh, even here I extended this mango row a little bit and I planted three more pickering trees. Okay. And uh, you can kind of barely see them in here because I've planted so much else like around pickering? it. Or that? Just, you like pickering or just one of them that does great out here? Uh, I personally really like the fruit, but what I also like about the tree is it's a heavy producer, it's disease resistant, it's a compact tree. So I planted these at 10 foot. And I wouldn't do that with many other mango varieties, right? You know that problem is yeah. planting them too close. But with Pickering, they're a very compact grower. And 10 foot is a manageable space for that variety. So I planted those as very small plants. You can see that one, that one, and there's another one hiding back there. And then in between them, I put in jack beans which is this right here. This is jack bean, and that's another nitrogen fixer, and that grows and shades the ground so it keeps the mango roots happy. And I've got, here's another salad tree in here. This one makes the really giant leaves. Look at that. Wow. So you can make a, a nice burrito out of that. And, and they grow uh, all year. Yeah, yeah, they grow all year. And uh, you know, some months they may be growing slower than others. Right now, with all the humidity and rain, they're growing super fast. Do they get a lot of wilt when it's really hot out and dry? Um, they can if they're, uh, it depends, because there's a night and day difference if you plant them and you don't put enough mulch. The roots are very sensitive, so the, the sun's gonna heat up the ground and they'll be stressed. But these ones, they have mulch and they have all these other plants, so those roots are kept nice and cool and happy. So even though we're on two and a half acres, our planting areas are all somewhat small and split up from each other. So we're gonna, we have to use the space in the most creative way that we can. So I've even got this little strip right here on the, on the top of the swale. And I've got custard apples here. There's a San Pablo. And I got bananas in between these as well. And then here's a, a painter's charolata. I wish I could, I could show you a fruit and step up in here. Where is it? Here's a little, nice. little cherilata fruit. So that's a cross of custard apple and cherimoya. It's got the, the fruity flavor of custard apple, but the chewiness of the cherimoya. I love them. I have back a hatchy grass here that's kind of holding that edge, and we cut that every so often too. There's a Hawaiian Huamoa plantain in between. And I've got a Fernandez custard apple. This one came from Julian. And then um, another Huamoa and a sugar apple at the end. And then uh, the other side of the fence is our, the rest of our Anona Grove. So I have 
10 different Anona trees over here. Now, how does it work here with uh, critters? Do you get a lot of uh, raccoons or squirrels? I actually don't. Just because of the way our property is situated, where we have the highway over there, and um, a lot of properties in Lakshahaji have are backed up to woods or like vacant lots. We are not, and I think, especially because of the highway, I don't really get any iguanas, I don't really get any squirrels. Uh, there are a lot of cats, but uh, they don't really do much damage. Uh, and then we have birds, but. I don't get a lot of pest issues other than your typical like insect pests that are kind of everywhere and we try to take care of those. Now what about foot traffic? Are you concerned when these grow up get fruit there'll be foot traffic here taking it? Uh, not so much that either because this side of the property is, I, I only have really two neighbors on the other side of the street. Just this guy right across and then the other one down there, he's a trucker and uh, those are my only two neighbors so I don't really have any real exposure on this side uh, now at the front maybe in several years our mangoes might be you know hanging over the fence a little bit and people will uh, maybe try to get on their tiptoes and pick some fruit there but um, you know we'll we'll try and manage that as it as it comes if it becomes a problem sure you know I don't see it as too much of an issue uh, this is this actually right here, this used to be our annual veggie garden up until just a couple months ago. I decided it was better purposed as a, an additional nursery space for, uh, these are a lot of my kind of personal collection of different trees and larger stuff that I'm kind of growing out for propagation purposes. So there's like uh, some big mulberries in here that I propagate from. Wow, look at that this one. one's a Thai dwarf mulberry. Much larger fruit than that typical dwarf ever bearing. Sure. So go ahead and pick some of those if you want. Wow. And then this one is a one that's real special to me and I think that it's kind of done with its fruiting right now. It did just make a good crop. Let's see if I can find some. This is a green mulberry and it is way different than the other uh, purple type mulberries in that it doesn't taste like a berry, it tastes like honey. And they look kind of unripe when you see them, right? Yeah, they're just a little bit of an off-ripe, off-white color. Um, yellowish green. The birds definitely don't see them, so that's a plus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that one I can't find any fruit on it. But I've got other stuff in my, it's just kind of my, my collection of stuff that's staying in pots my oldest. And um, I see here you're using the, the black poly pipe instead of the PVC. Is that a common uh, yeah. choice amongst nurseries or is that just what you prefer? Well for this type of setup uh, like I have the PVC that's my water supply back there and then we split it off into these these uh, flexible one inch poly lines and uh, this is this is how we use for the drip irrigation or the spot spitters so you actually just take this little tubing and you cut it into a, a sharp angle you poke a hole and just stick it right in and these are great because there's nothing to clog there it's it's just a little slit where the water comes out so uh, when we run the irrigation we just run it for like five minutes and it spot waters each individual pot and keeps these big trees happy some of the stuff I'm just growing up to sell when it's bigger too Planted a, a new little thing right here. There's some Eugenia's there. And this is the other part of the Anona Grove. I could point out some fruits on here. This one is the overachiever this year. This is the, the red sugar apple, Kampong Mauve sugar apple. Best sugar apple I've ever had. It's delicious. I think I had one or two off this tree last year when it was in a pot. And it is producing about as much as this little tree can handle. Do you hand pollinate these? I did not hand pollinate any of these. So uh, they may not have set as much fruit as they potentially could have, but uh, there's plenty, and this is just, there's less than a year in the ground here, so I'm not really worried about pushing them to produce now. Uh, but uh, like this is a dream Atamoya, 
And I did get one fruit on here with no hand pollination. It didn't flower very much. So I'm happy that I got one fruit. And then I have a Lisa Atamoya here that I did not hand pollinate either. And it's got a good number of fruit on there. It's one, two, three. Uh, a couple more down here I'm not seeing anymore. There's at least four or five fruits on there. First year in the ground, didn't, didn't bother to hand pollinate it. This one's a little PPC Atamoya. No fruit on that yet. This is all of our turmeric stock that we started this year. I want to grab onto this and just step over and back it up a little too close. And this, we're kind of getting to the back of the property where our production area is. So this is where we pot up all the plants and we start the seeds on this table. We just got a load of potting soil this morning. What kind of potting soil do you use? Uh, this is a custom blend that comes from Atlas. Yes, okay. And it is 40% uh, Canadian peat, 40% pine bark, 10% uh, sand, and 10% sawdust. So it's, uh, it is a very well draining and at the same time moisture retaining mix. And then uh, what we do is we take a few scoops out of this pile with a tractor, we spread it out and we mix in different amendments uh, and fertilizer into it and we incorporate it into the whole pile so that when we're potting up plants there's an even distribution of fertility through the soil so we get even root growth that way right and a lot of nurseries don't do it that way they'll they'll fill their pot and just dump a handful of fertilizer in and then put the plant in there and you can get even uneven root growth that way so we're spending a little extra time um, paying attention to those roots and trying to build a strong tree. This is uh, some of our native plants that are growing up back here. And then have a, there's a shade house here where we're propagating a lot of stuff. I can briefly show you this. Like even right here. We've got some grafts going. These are the uh, Black Suriname Cherry, the Zill Dark variety, and these are pretty new grafts that are, they still have the bag on for the humidity, and they're just starting to push out. You can just see the new leaves starting to push out in there. So I've uh, been experimenting with different grafting techniques, and the humidity bags definitely tend to help. Got lots of shampoo ginger in here we're growing out for next year. Very cool, man. Yeah, this, this is all kind of the rootstock and seedling and production area before the plants are ready to go out to the front to sell. They grow up for a little bit back here. And we've got more stuff in the ground as well, just uh, kind of wrapped around this backyard fence line with different fruit trees. Some low plots, mulberries, more bananas. Oh, yeah, I gotta show you this. This is that Scarlet Jabotacaba. This wow. one's gotta be the fastest fruiting one. This is a, a variety that can fruit at about three years old, three or four years old. So this is probably a four year old tree and it's uh, making a nice little crop right now. Very nice, man. So yeah, there's a lot more I could show you, but uh, we don't want to make a three hour long video. <laughs> but we'll come back for another part and sure. we appreciate all you're doing. And uh, oh, is, here's the fruit you can try. Is that a uh, Potuma or a Lemon Mangosteen? Yeah, Potoma. Potoma. Here you go. Just give me the seeds. Potoma, everybody. It's, uh, it's a relative of the Suriname cherry and it tastes like a sweet and tart apricot. Very nice. Yeah, I have five of these planted, so it's one of my favorites. There you go. Thank you. All those seeds getting planted. All right, everybody, there it is. Incredible edible landscape. That does website, turnaround shows you website again. I'll put the link below as well. Incrediblelandscapes.com. Connor, thank you very much for having us come out. Everybody, come out here. And if you like this video, uh, please subscribe. We got more videos like this to show everybody. Uh, and help promote the places that are helping you grow your food and grow your trees. 
So thank you a lot, Connor. If you're in the Loxahatchee area or Palm Beach County in general and you're looking to grow food and find out what's up with all these fruit trees, just come see us. We'd love to have you. All righty. Thanks. All right, everybody. That was Connor's amazing place. The link is below the video. Please remember to check it out. And if you like this video and you like me to go to other places, just uh, if you know of a place, put it below in the comments and I'll try to get there. If you know a nursery or somewhere else. And if you have a yard and you're growing fruit trees, my email is below as well. Contact me if you want me to come out, especially if you're in the South Florida area. Thank you, Connor, for taking the time out to show us about your amazing nursery and all the great trees and edible greens that you have. And I definitely want to recommend to people, if you're looking to put in a garden or just get some edible greens growing where you can make uh, your, your house mostly just all edible, the things you eat, not just trees, but leaves and greens. Connor's the man, and thank you, Connor, for being on here. I'm so glad we finally got to get you on here and support Connor and his business, everybody. And thank you, everybody, for watching this. Please subscribe and share this with others. Until then, everybody, have a great day and keep growing.